aircraft that flew from Perth to London. Thank you, Maria. Um, a lot of faces out there I recognise, um, and uh, you probably know a fair bit about the subject as well. So the subject is Norman Brealy. He made an enormous contribution to aviation in Western Australia and Australia. As I drove around the corner down there, there's a blackish building on the corner on the north side with a red protuberance on the top. And that's the block where he built his first hangar. So as you leave here today, if you drive down there, just before you turn left or right, the building on the right is where he had really had his hangar. I think it shouldn't have a park on it. We should talk to the heritage people and do something about it. Okay, so <clears throat> Norman Brealey's contribution to aviation certainly had a great effect on Western Australia and certainly on Australia because he was the first to make a success of commercial aviation. I've got some slides here which I'll present to you to keep the show on the road. And uh, <clears throat> so the reason why we're talking here today is that he had his hangar down there on that block of land that I was just talking about and he used this strip of land here uh, as an aerodrome for three years, 1920, 21, 22 and 23. Um, it was in fact first, first airport. So there's a look at it, a strip of land, uh, first used in 1920. And aren't we lucky <coughs> to have that strip of land for fly-ins? We had the Red Bull Air Races here, and it gives the people with vintage aircraft a chance to bring their aircraft up here and for us to have a look at them. Um, and so um, that's why I consider that we're very lucky having this in the, in the heart of the city. Norman Brealey, Major Norman Brealey, MC, DSO, both of those awards presented to him by King George V and the Air Force Cross as well. Later he got a CBE uh, and this made him a standout among people. A bit of background on Norman. He was born in Geelong in 1890. His family came to Western Australia in 1906. Norman had finished his schooling and did an apprenticeship uh, in the heavy uh, manufacturing area and uh, became fully qualified. He paid, paid his way to England and paid for his first two hours of flying lessons and went solo in an hour and 50. So it's a bit of a natural. Although things were a bit different in those days. A lot of people went solo in a few hours. Um, he uh, was in action uh, a few months after he'd finished his training and got shot down. A bullet damaged both lungs. He was lucky. He crashed in no man's land and had to crawl at night uh, back to safe territory. And um, then he had a long convalescence uh, to get well. In fact, it took that long that he suggested that he come back to the better weather of Western Australia. So I'm not quite sure whether he milked the system, but he got a free trip out. I'll probably touch on a few things throughout the day where he could have milked the system just a little bit. And another one followed because he did a lot of swimming at Crawley Bars to build up his strength and condition. He was strong enough after a short while to marry his sweetheart, Violet Stubbs. And then she was engaged as a nurse to accompany him back to England 
that maybe she didn't pay for her way to get back, nor did he. He was in, in a non-combat role when he got back there, and uh, a well-organised individual, and he ended up running the Gosport Special School of Flying. It was where they trained instructors and developed uh, fighter tactics, and he became a skillful and well-trained pilot. At the end of the war, he knew the Avro 504 very well because it was used at the Gosport School. He knew its weaknesses, he knew its strengths. He <coughs> bought two of them for 700 pounds, a lot of money in those days. He bought a spare engine and he bought spare parts for the aircraft. A lot of people decided that they would set up a commercial aviation business in Australia after World War I. They came back with one or two miscellaneous aircraft and no spares. They got it wrong. These people ended up with the aircraft in uh, paddocks, no spare parts, aircraft falling apart. But Norman had projected himself ahead. He had two aircraft, a spare engine that could be maintained and put, swung into an aircraft at the first opportunity. He employed Peter Hansen, a well-qualified World War I mechanic from the Royal Flying Corps. The aircraft were in their original boxes when they arrived here. They had the red, white and blue roundel on them and people were very patriotic in those days and they really felt that Norman had done a service by bringing these aircraft back to Perth. That's Peter Hansen standing at the wing and Norman really proudly showing off his aircraft at Belmont. Really introduced his service officially on the 2nd of August at the Wacker Ground. He took Mr Lathlane the Lord Mayor for a flight, got to 2,000 feet over the sea, 4,000 people paid to get into the Wacker Ground to see his uh, performance. It was a gala day, uh, there were races and the band played on and all sorts of things apart from Normans, um, major Normans uh, performance. Um, he made a mistake on the way back from taking the Lord Mayor for a flight, in that he fouled some electric wires around the Wacker. There was a, a push bike track for cycle racing around the perimeter of the Wacker, and there was lighting for night shows, and he snagged the wire just by a fraction, carried out a heavy landing, and damaged the aircraft. Damaged the undercarriage such that it couldn't fly again that day. But he made an apologetic announcement jumped into a fast car, drove out to Belmont where his other aircraft was, hopped into it and was back in under half an hour. <laughs> he put on an aerobatic display, the likes of Whitham, which had never been seen in Perth, loop after loop after loop. Spiral dives, spins, immelman turns, falling leaf, you name it, he was doing it. The people of Perth were agog, both the 4,000 in the Wacker and the few thousand outside. He was the talk of the town. People were talking about Major Brearley and his performance for weeks and weeks afterwards. <coughs> Belmont, which was where he was conducting his joyrides, because that was how he was going to make his money, joyrides and advertising, barnstorming, um, proved to be a little bit out of the way and it wasn't really convenient nor was the surface good. So he decided to use a number of other avenues for his displays. Claremont Showground was a good one. It was big, lots of room. Subiaco Oval, pretty good as well. Lowton Park became Perth Oval and now Members Equity, I think it's called. Uh, that was quite open as well. North Fremantle, uh, he flew in and out of there, taking people for rides at five pounds a pop. 
five pounds doesn't sound a lot to us, but when you consider that the average weekly earnings, a good wage, good average wage, was between two pounds and two pounds ten, two and a half pounds. And so he was getting the equivalent of two good wages per flight. And if you think in very round terms of a thousand dollars being a good wage today, he was getting two grand per flight. And he was taking people in the air who were queuing up hand line after line of them. He recouped his seven hundred pounds very quickly, plus plus. He developed his business away from the authorities in the eastern states. He has evidently said to a number of people, I made the rules and I obeyed every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some of the aircraft at, uh, well the aircraft at uh, Claremont. Ten dollars a ride, doesn't sound a lot, but at uh, five pounds a pop, heaps. Got to the stage where special trains and trams were laid on. Special trains from Perth and Fremantle to Subiaco Oval. Special trains to Claremont Showground. Uh, people just lined up. He had uh, lucky envelopes which were thrown out of the aircraft. Swan Brewery was behind these and they had three guineas as first prize. Second prize was two guineas, third prize was one guinea. So he'd fly over a, an area, throw out three envelopes, and if the average wage was two and a half pounds and you could get three and a bit pounds out of one of these envelopes, people scrambled right, left and centre for them. Excellent advertising for Norman. And I think I mentioned they had other attractions. Uh, people remember egg and spoon races, three-legged races, all that sort of stuff. Um, they all took place and the bands played on. <laughs> Norman decided that uh, he was using up the, uh, the Perth customers and he should go to the country. So he took off to Albany, went as far north as Onslow and started to talk to politicians as he went north because if you imagine what transport was like in those days, there hadn't been many advances from 1913-14 and motor vehicles were very rare. And so to have an aircraft doing 80 miles an hour from one part of the northwest to the next means you could... And the, the other means of transport was by uh, horse and cart, camel, train or by ship. And it used to take uh, 10 days, 2 weeks to get from Derby to Perth in a ship. So he uh, certainly pushed his luck and advertised. Kalgoorlie was where the money was. The miners, as per today, were earning good money and they were prepared to part with it for the thrill of flying. At York, uh, there's a photo of two of his passengers, the Prido sisters. Um, I guess he put two in for the price of one there. And that's a photo of his aircraft at Kalgoorlie. But in promoting his business, oops, um, he had photos taken to compare it to the camel train. There were five million sheep in the northwest and very few people, but they needed to get around and he was the man to cart them around in his aeroplane. This photo was taken by the father of someone who's here today. Where is he? Oh, he's not here. Bruce Rathbone was his father, who was a surveyor. That's out of a different era, about 1920 up there. Um, that's what they were using in 1923 to 1927 when this photo was taken. But Belmont, which is where he kept his aircraft, he had two uh, shacks built there to house his aircraft. It was too far out of town and he decided that he had to move. And so 
he established a link with MP Durack, Michael Durack, MLA for the Northwest. MP Durack lived in the house down on the corner that I was talking about, and Brilli's hangars were built in his backyard. <coughs> An incidental thing that just happens to come up here is that Michael Durack had a daughter, Mary. Probably you don't realise that she became Dame Mary Durack and she married Hori Miller from Robinson Miller Aviation. So that house on the corner down there had a, a real link to aviation in Western Australia. And there it is, that's the shed, or two sheds for his aircraft, in the backyard of Durack's house. In those days, Langley Park had been reclaimed and it was in a very rough condition. There was no Riverside Drive and what's that one there? Terrace Road. Uh, it was a track. And this was pretty rough stuff out here. I can remember my father telling me that he went to St. Patrick's round about where the uh, Royal Perth Hospital is and he used to come down here in his lunch hour and play in the reeds along the riverfront. And so Norman set up, uh, that's Norman in the white suit there, and the chap in the dark suit is uh, John McIntosh. <clears throat> he bought the aircraft, that aircraft off Brealey, and was dead two weeks later. He became the first aviation fatality in Western Australia. And so I've talked about where that shed or hangar was on the corner down there. I'll ask you to have a look at it on your way home. And there it is in a photo <coughs> as we would see it today. So there's really taking off in one of his aircraft out the front here. In 1921, <clears throat> the federal government decided that they had to reshape uh, their communication system. They needed to have air mail and get mail distributed yeah. among the population at a, fair, at a much faster rate than was normally happening. And so they decided to um, call tenders. Norman had been over East on a number of occasions and they had discussions with him and said, you know, we're thinking of setting up a system. How do you think it should go? And he said, well, I've got the answer for you because I've been operating aircraft for two years. And uh, they knew that he'd made a success of his business, so he really set the scene for his own contract. £25,000 per year for a two-year contract to keep the show on the road. He won the tender personally and then set up a company, Western Australian Airways, and he sold some of the shares and put $5,000 in his own pocket and sold shares to businessmen in town. Couldn't get his hands on all of the money to start with. He had to earn it as the, the year went on, £25,000 over a year. So he had a very, very busy time getting established. He really thought of giving it away on a number of occasions, but he's too far in. <clears throat> he built a bigger hangar just out there, 100 metres down. That <clears throat> pump house is still there, just down there, and it was 50 metres the other side of that. That hangar um, was. Uh, he got that from Black Boy Hill. Anyone know where Black Boy Hill is or was? Yeah, out Midland Way. And it was where soldiers were trained during World War I. So that became his first hangar and service centre. If we look at the, the map there, there's a dotted line between Perth and Geraldton. The airmail service 
could not operate in competition with an existing railway. And so the federal government decided that the contract would be between Geraldton and Derby. And so Norman got the, the show on the road, but he had a lot to do. He had staff to hire, he went over east and personally tested pilots and selected six. And there are some of them. <coughs> Charles Kingsford Smith, the next one, Bob Fawcett. In the middle is Billy himself. Then there is Len Taplin, and then on the end is Val Abbott. I don't think Val Abbott ever flew for the airline or the air service. He was a lawyer, and I think Norman took him on board for his good help in other areas. There was another one, Arthur Blake, and he had sent Arthur Blake up the track to look at uh, the airfields. He got as far as Geraldton and contacted Norman and said, this is <coughs> a disgrace, it's an absolute mess. You just can't land an aeroplane on the prepared airfield here. The contract was to prepare the airfields was put out to people who never, probably never seen an aeroplane. What they prepared was just un unrealistic. So he hired a farmer's field next door and that is the current, when I say next door, quite close, but that's the current Geraldton Aerodrome today. Um, <clears throat> and so that photo was taken on the 3rd of December. On the 4th of December they flew three aircraft to Geraldton. And on the following day, the Monday, they took off on their first day of the mail delivery service for Western Australian Airways. Unfortunately, a fatal accident on the first morning. They'd only gone 100 miles. Taplin's aircraft developed a rough running engine. He landed in the paddock at Murchison House. And then Fawcett overflew that <coughs> and circled it, got too slow, stalled and spun in. He and his passenger and engineer by the name of Broad were killed. And so Norman had to regroup. He had good support from other people and one of Norman's traits was if things went bad, blame someone else. And he did. He blamed the federal government for not having the emergency, the contract was to make airfields and emergency landing airfields and he um, they hadn't made emergency landing fields. If the land, emergency landing fields were prepared, then uh, Taplin could have soldiered on with his rough running engine and landed in one of them, but he didn't, he landed and then the accident occurred. So there were a few problems there. It took another month for him to establish the business and initially it only went from Geraldton to Port Hedland for a couple of weeks and then it went on to Derby and the, the service was established. You may remember the, the photo with the lineup of pilots where they were wearing their Royal Flying Corps uniforms. Well, that wasn't how they worked. This is how they worked. It was pretty hot up there, pretty rough, pretty bouncy stuff. And they worked hard. Mind you, <coughs> they only worked two, three days a week. And they were paid $1,400. No, wait, no, no, don't quote me. No, I'll have to go back on that. Uh, but they were paid well over three times the uh, average wage, a good average wage. They eventually went on strike. They reckoned that they weren't having, uh, getting enough money. So really, as well as introducing the first airline in Australia and Western Australia uh, was looking at the first strike of airline pilots. <coughs> he used Langley Park as his service centre. And so he had half a dozen aircraft, three of them required for the service, and as they rotated, they'd come down to here and be serviced, and then back up north to run the mail. The, I th 
tend to sometimes change between Langley Park and Esplanade East or East Eastern Esplanade. That's what it was called in those early days. Langley Park didn't come into being, and I think I've got a slide further in, where the name was changed when Riverside Drive was opened by the Deputy Mayor, Mr Langley, and so Langley Park came to being. In 1923, the government decided that the duplication of services between railway and airlines, or the, the banning of the airline duplication, uh, should come to an end. In fact, <coughs> the British Empire had a look at their distribution of mail. They said, we're really going to sort this out, and what you're doing in Australia is not too, too smart. And so what we're going to do is have that service come through to Perth. So in 1923, they made that decision. They purchased the land. Um, and there's the slide, the name change. And they purchased <coughs> land at Mayland Aerodrome. So that became the terminus of Brealey's operation. We're saying Australia wouldn't be too happy with that, would they? <laughs> The staff used to catch the train and the tram and the bus and meet outside of a shop near the Mount Woolley subway and that truck would take them to Mayland's aerodrome each morning and bring them back each afternoon. The shed, the hangar, the bigger one was moved from just outside here to Mayland's aerodrome <coughs> and the service took place there. The aircraft that really had bought for the service were not the aircraft, the Avros, which I've talked about earlier on, but the service used Bristol Tourers, a tried and proven fighter aircraft from World War I. So there's three of the Bristol Tourers in the early days of mainland territory. The aircraft were, or the engines were water cooled. And with the hot conditions up there, they had to cart water with them. And so in the red dotted circle there, you can see that there is a water container between the wheels. When they didn't cart water, they often carted mail. These aircraft only carried two passengers. By the time you put a little bit of mail in there and a, a bit, of, uh, bit of freight, um, they ran out of room and they had to think about putting items in what was called a governance bag. And that's where the governance bag sat and the water took the place of the governance bag. Things had to be moved around in a hurry at times and a coffin could be moved from the north to Perth in a matter of a day or so. Uh, and that was how it was shifted. Uh, suspended underneath the aircraft. Among the early pilots was a man named Charles Kingford Smith, Smithy. He was uh, famous for a number of reasons, but also for uh, his way with women. He used to cart his motorbike around underneath the aircraft, jump onto it in Port Hedland, and speed out to a station where he had a girlfriend, and then speed back and then continue along the way. Norman tried to keep an eye on these things as much as he could, but <clears throat> the mail used to get through. The mail, uh, the telephone calls used to get through, and the calls used to be prefixed with something like this, expect the green paint tomorrow. <laughs> green paint, Norman really. <laughs> the people up the track were well worn. And um, Len Taplin had a, uh, a date with a girl in Port Hedland and uh, both the seats had been sold to customers so he had to keep his date and the only way to get from Broome to Port Hedland was to sit on the wing. Good view. 
<laughs> the quick purchase of Mayland land for an aerodrome uh, didn't allow them to do a hundred year survey of water levels and by 1926 it had flooded and so it proved the, the worth of Maylands. A levee bank had to be built around it, a drainage ditch all the way inside of that, the pumps were installed and they virtually operated daily. It was known that uh, a car would drive down the, the strip or the, the runway, the, the airfield, the water would be sprayed out from where the wheels were and the aeroplane <laughs> would follow with its wheels in the same tracks as the car a second or five seconds later to get airborne in some of the wet conditions. Really decided that he needed to move up in the aircraft stakes. He bought three DH-50s, <coughs> carried four passengers. So he'd gone from the Bristol Tour that carried two passengers up to the uh, DH-50 which carried four. That was a full load, a suitcase, three people and a pilot. The pilot sat out in the open. Really pushed the envelope. I know it's a modern saying, but he really did push the envelope. He purchased three DH-50s. The contract for £25,000 had an add-on of maintenance. So the federal government was going to give him £25,000 a year plus maintenance. So he really decided that he was going to build some spare parts for a DH-50. In fact, he produced that many. He could put them all together and he had another aeroplane. <laughs> then he did it again and again. So after buying three aircraft, he had six in the air. It was the first aircraft production system uh, in Western Australia, another first for Brearley. That's a photo of the workshop where the aircraft produced. He then decided to move up to a bigger aircraft, the Giant Moth, the DH-61. It carried eight passengers. That's the Giant Moth with four passengers on board. Pretty crammed with four. You'd really be feeling it if you had eight passengers on board. There was a, an international conference in London in 1927. And once again, the Empire said, we've got to look at how we distribute our mail. We've got to get the mail across Australia. Rather than waiting for ships to carry it from Fremantle to Adelaide and then distribute it by rail, we'd have to introduce something else. We're going to have the air mail service across Australia. <clears throat> and so they contacted Brearley and said, what do you reckon? He said, I'm just your man. I know the aircraft you need and we should be able to put a, a show together. So he got a two year contract. Well, I don't know, a five year contract. So it got underway in 1928, a five year contract. That's the aircraft that he used, the DH-66. It carried 14 passengers. The mail arrived at Fremantle by ship. It was driven at speed to Mayland's aerodrome, put onto the DH-66 and flown to Adelaide. This required new hangars to be built at Maylands, at Forest, where they overnighted at a hostel, and then at Adelaide, a new hangar was built there. Quite a change in uh, the system. But the idea of getting mail across Australia uh, was answered by Brearley. That's the hostel at Forest in those early days. I spent a number of time, a number of weeks out there in the 1960s, and it hadn't changed very much. I'm pretty sure it was the same furniture. <laughs> the meals were still good. They were excellent meals. But really, 
was always with an eye on profit. The contract to fly the mail across Australia had things written into it as, to, as regards the load, the weight. And if he exceeded a certain poundage, then the price would go up for him. And so he set up a business with Joseph Charles, a real estate agent, and said, if you start advertising in the eastern states, then we can put airmail stamps on that, and we can get it over east in a hurry, and this will add to our load. And if you print it on cardboard, it'll weigh a bit more. <laughs> and <clears throat> we'll make money out. We'll both make money out. I'll give you a share of the profits, and uh, we'll make money out of land sales. And so off they went. But the federal government post office uh, discovered that there was something awry, and they wrote a, a special clause that if the mail went up by a certain amount, uh, da -da 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 -da, then it wouldn't apply. So they wrote him out of it. Um, but he had another go. While I'm putting in these bits about the pushing of the envelope, the man was still a whiz -bang. There's no doubt about it. His contribution was enormous. I'm just highlighting this to make it a bit lighthearted. Uh, but it, there was a lot of real serious work went on. He was restricted in the aircraft purchase that he could buy. He had to buy British. And the British hadn't produced a really good aircraft. But he decided that he, after purchasing four or five of the DH-66s, and they weren't performing too well for him, that he purchased this new type of Vickers Fiastra. Uh, two engines, um, supposedly going to solve all of his problems. Well, it was one of the biggest disasters uh, in his career. You'll see that aircraft, the Vickers Fiastra, with different types of engines on each side, carrying a spare engine underneath. You'll see a four-bladed propeller on one side and a geared propeller and on the other side a two-bladed non-geared engine. And imagine, some of you have got pilot licenses and twin endorsements, imagine feeding the throttles forward with these RPMs varying widely, thrust varying widely, wriggling throttles and pumping away with your feet to keep the shine. Um, it would have been an exciting sort of arrangement, and uh, it happened far too often. In 1934, <coughs> the government decided that Brealey's contract had run out. He got it in 1929, a five-year contract, and uh, it ran out. And at that stage, the federal government said, right, all contracts are out. We're going to let every contract in Australia. And so the Northwest contract, which really still held, <coughs> was up for tender. A bloke by the name of Horry Miller won it. To the shock of Norman, he couldn't believe that he lost it. Norman uh, sort of complained loudly on a number of occasions to the federal government. They, they didn't listen, they said, no, it's fair. He said, he, Miller can't possibly make success of it. I've got the equipment, I've got the aircraft, I've got the knowledge, um, he can't make a go of it. And they said, well, we believe he can. So he did. And that was around about the time that he married Mary from down the corner. Here. Of the aircraft that Miller bought, three of them. Quite reliable aircraft. And there he is with McPherson Robertson, the man behind the truck set, and Lolly Factory. McPherson Robinson uh, put a fair bit of money. Anyone remember barley sugar? Where you had to have barley sugar when you went flying? Well, because of him. He used to make it. <laughs> So the, the new service, with that extract from the WA newspaper, had Miller flying up the coast of Western Australia. Brealey was left with the east-west run.
and this is where the whole system came unstuck. The British government decided that if the Dutch could run an air service from Europe to the Dutch East Indies, then they could extend their service from London to India. They could extend it to Singapore. And so if Australia woke up and provided a service from Australia to Singapore, they'd have the airmail connection, England to Australia. Three of the big heads got themselves together, Hunts and Fish, from the existing Qantas. Norman Brearley, from his West Australian Airways. And Charles Owen, another famous name. Hudson Fish wasn't very happy with the proposals being put forward by Ulm and uh, Brearley, and so he said, no chaps, I, I can't go along with you, I'm going to do this on my own. So he set up Qantas Empire Airways. And so that was the first service that linked Brisbane to Singapore. And so look at the ramifications of that. The blue, the light blue on the diagram brought the mail into Australia and it was distributed from Brisbane either by rail or any other means because they'd taken away the idea that mail, air mail couldn't duplicate, be duplicated over rail. And so they were getting the, the mail to Brisbane in quick time. The service between Perth and Adelaide didn't require very much at all. The local mail across Australia wasn't particularly high. Mail to Europe, Perth, through to Wyndham and Daly Waters was being handled by MMA at Robinson Miller. So at Robinson Miller and Qantas sorted out the overseas mail. And Norman Brearley was left with an airline crossing Australia that didn't have a lot of traffic either mail or passengers. In the end, the government withdrew the subsidy and said, listen, how about you try and make it go of it on your own? Um, sell seats to passengers and see how you go. Well, the writing was on the wall. <clears throat> Norman could see that he either had to get super big and buy aircraft from overseas and get into another business or get out. He was made an offer by Adelaide Airways. That was what <coughs> Norman really bought, a DH-84, a good British aircraft. He ran it without subsidy, but the end was nigh. So West Australian Airways offered Norman some money. I don't have a third figure on it, but I think it was 25,000 pounds. Whatever the offer was, he quickly said, yes, yes, please. Adelaide Airways was part of Adelaide Steamship Company, and there was also uh, Hollywood Steamship Company from Tasmania to Australia, and Hollywood Airways, and the Steamship companies decided that they would take over the whole show. And so Australian National Airways was set up with Hollyman, Adelaide Airways, Adelaide Steamship, Hollyman Steamship, etc. All mixed up in one big pot and Norman was on the outer. And so Norman's airline had survived for only 15 years. Not that long when you consider it but he dined out on it for many more years to follow. There he is, he got license number two. Some people say they never issued license number one. But some years later it was issued to Amy Johnson, who was the first lady to fly an aeroplane from England to Australia. And there's <coughs> Sir Norman, ex-major, embassy, ASC, DSO, CBE. Quite a, an imposing figure. 
There it is, you can probably just see the number two on the license there. So, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Why did it really pay £700 pounds for his first aircraft when Britain had 22,000 surplus aircraft at the end of World War I that were sold mostly for scrap for £10? Pounds? Yep. He bought brand new aircraft in the crate and paid top dollar. Yep. He admitted that. <laughs> well, he got his money back in a hurry. Um, yeah. There's a couple of other things to talk about. How are you doing for time? We've taken a bit longer than anticipated. I'll be quick. Are you happy with another couple of little stories? In 1924, really disbanded Western Australian Airways and set up West Australian Airways. He had a a fund which was for aircraft replacement and had £17,000 in it. He thought that if the federal government over east knew that he had £17,000 when they issued the next contract, they'd take that into account. So he took out the £17,000 and distributed it among his shareholders. He then gave the new company only the equipment necessary for its operation. So he kept a, a lot of it to one side and sold that. And the profits went to shareholders. One of his aircraft caught fire and burnt in 1924. He didn't get a very good result from his insurance company. So he started his own insurance company. And instead of the profits going to the insurance company, he collected the profits in a separate company that went to his shareholders. He moved into aerial photography. The contract was let. Aerial Surveys of Western Australia was his new company. They hired their aircraft from West Australian Airways at a very cheap rate, and they made an enormous profit which went to the shareholders of the Air Survey Company, which was first of all offered to his original airline shareholders. There's nothing really wrong with this. I'm sure if you went into insurance companies in Perth, and taxi companies and airlines and so on, they're all doing the same thing today. It's just that it's in the books and people start to give the knife a bit of a, a skew when it comes to Norman. But he was only doing what people are doing today. Uh, his idea was to make profit for his shareholders. Nothing wrong with that. Do it the best way you can. Do it legally. And you're not in front. So that's about all I've got to say.